As you know, uh, I attend the committee meetings on Tuesdays uh, where the public can attend but not speak. I'm concerned that the public does not have ample opportunity to weigh in on issues that are discussed in the Tuesday meetings. In this case, you're voting on $1.3 million expenditure on the North Omaha coal plant. It's unlikely that anything anybody on this side says today is going to have any influence whatsoever on your vote. As you know, people have been urging you to shut down the old and dirty North Omaha plant, yet we have had no formal indication of what your intentions are. Uh, we are disheartened that you uh, are voting for more expenditures for the North Omaha plant when the only question that has been asked is the one that was just asked again, can this equipment be used if we convert to natural gas? The real question is, what is your plan for coal? You have 20 year commitments to wind and to nuclear and even beyond when you're talking about decommissioning, nothing about decommissioning coal. What is your plan for coal? The Union of Concerned Scientists revealed that Nebraska is the fourth highest state in spending per capita for coal. What is your plan to change this? The Omaha World Herald asked a question about the controversy over whether MUD should be privatized. They said, would the short-term benefits of any sale outweigh the long-term costs? I ask you a similar question in light of the financial environmental and health costs of coal. What is your long-term plan for coal and how much money will you keep pouring into that dinosaur plant in North Omaha? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Graham Jordison. Uh, I think David summed up a lot of uh, how I'm feeling about um, uh, this issue. I, I just want to bring up a few points. This is a life extension project. Um, a, a few months ago you were talking, it sounded like to the World Herald that there would be a 2016 phase out. Now you're putting $1.3 million into preserving the life of this plant. The public doesn't know where you're going with retirement, phase out, natural gas. Uh, I'd like to see a motion today to wait till we get the stakeholders process figured out and give your ratepayers an opportunity to engage in the discussion. Um, we heard months ago that there was going to be a stakeholders process. We thought that that process was going to allow us to um, raise concern on these issues and it hasn't. It hasn't happened yet. So um, I think the public would really like to, to see a wait and to have an opportunity to engage with you on this. and. Uh, as we discussed last meeting, a lot of people can't come here uh, Thursday mornings at 10 a.m., so thank you. Thank you. Cynthia Tiedemann, 7562 Drexel Street. And I'm going to kind of echo some of what's already been said, but I'm, I'm really concerned. The union, about a year ago, the Union of Concerned Scientists identified coal plants in the United States that were ripe for retirement, and that included North Omaha coal plant. They said that we needed to start making a plan to retire the plant, and they weren't talking about because of public health problems, which, which I think there are, or climate issues. They were talking about economic issues, and they said it's not cost effective to run an old coal plant like that. It's not cost effective to run it, let alone upgrade it like a retrofit like we're talking about today. So I don't know if you go to the Tuesday meetings and learn about this and then come here a couple days later and unanimously approve it, or I don't know if you're working with a plan. Do you, um, I would expect that you have a long range plan that you're working on, but again, I've never heard anything about it. As Graham said, um, there is a stakeholders process, but we've never heard anything about what's the long range plan for the North Omaha coal plant. And I also would, would hope that you have the plan, 
And I would also hope that you discuss it with your public before um, making decisions like this. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Patricia Fuller from Council Bluffs. Even though I'm from Council Bluffs and I'm not a rate payer, uh, I still consider myself a stakeholder. Pollution from the North Omaha plant, uh, whether it's air pollution or water pollution, does not stop at the river. We share the same contaminated air and water from the Missouri. Your decisions do impact us in Council Bluffs. Uh, last January, we learned that Mid-American, in order to comply with the Clean Air Act, was closing down or phasing out seven of their oldest boilers, probably comparable in age than, to North Omaha. And these units were, two of these units were in Council Bluffs. Mid-American was also required to complete a project to cut emissions from two other coal burning units in Sargent Bluff. Yesterday, or this week, it was announced that Alliance is uh, converting their coal fire power plant in Clinton, Iowa, to gas generation. That makes the fourth of Alliance coal fire power plants in the Iowa, Minnesota region to either close down or convert. So at least we have a better understanding of what's going on in Iowa, whether these plants are closing down or converting. And I guess what all of us would like to see, rather than a transition to another fossil fuel, is a bigger commitment to either wind or solar. Mid-American did not stop at 400 megawatts of wind. They plan to build as much as 1,050 new megawatts of wind generation, which is adding to their already 2,285 uh, uh, megawatts that they have now. So it's pretty clear that their decisions were based on anticipation of future EPA regulations. Thank you. Well, the, uh, the past month, of course, we had a pretty extreme cold outbreak. Uh, one of the things that's interesting to me, this isn't the first time we've seen this pattern, although it is a rare pattern. Uh, what it does is uh, uh, bring uh, cold air out of Canada very rapidly before it has a chance to warm up much on the way down. Uh, this one was not as cold as uh, historical ones that have produced the, uh, the same kind of pattern because the air in Canada isn't as cold as it used to be, basically. Uh, of course, it did bring the term polar vortex into the uh, news media. They needed uh, something to hang on to it. It's not new. It's been around forever, as far as we know, and uh, this was just an example. Last month, uh, that vortex, that circulation, was uh, displaced toward uh, the uh, North American Atlantic Center. Uh, now it's uh, recentered itself a little bit so that it, it's more over the North Pole on the average, which means that Asia is getting more cold weather and we're getting a little less. However, we still have uh, a big ridge off the West Coast and a big uh, trough, which is prone to become a large circulation in the middle of the country. The consequence is that we're going to continue to see these storms that we've been having. For our district, it means a lot of wind, uh, more wind challenges coming up every few days, a succession of uh, cold blasts with uh, warmer air in between, uh, within the next few weeks, I don't see anything coming that looks quite like December, but uh, the other noteworthy thing is that this is a very dry pattern for us. Uh, most of the snow is well to our north. Uh, the uh, ridge on the west coast is not letting any rain in from the Pacific, so it's a case of more low flow. If we get enough cold weather, it's, uh, of course, more icing in the river. Uh, and if this persists going into spring, uh, they're going to have trouble letting uh, as much water as usual down the Missouri River. They're going to have to be holding quite a bit back because we're not getting it in the northern Rockies the way we usually do with the upper Missouri Basin in general. There is some moisture. We started out in the fall doing pretty well, but uh, we're not adding on to it the way we should be. 
Uh, so that's the uh, the overall big picture is that uh, the pattern has shifted eastward a little bit so that the uh, the worst of the cold weather for a while is going to be uh, hitting the Great Lakes and points east of us. Uh, however, the uh, basic pattern really hasn't changed greatly from what we were seeing a month ago. It's kind of stuck. Thanks, John. Thank, Thank you. you. I always look forward to your monthly updates. Thank you. <clears throat> Hi, um, Crystal Craig from La Vista. I'm um, <clears throat> so. What from what I understand, you're spending about another half a million dollars on the North Omaha coal plant. <clears throat> Recently, you had to make some repairs and shut down the Fort Calhoun plant right after you had it started. Um, could you please somebody go into some detail on exactly what those other repairs were um, and what the costs are for those repairs? And can you tell me if the rate payers are going to see an increase in their, on their bills because of any of these things that are... are I can answer that part, no. Uh, the short answer on the repairs of Fort Calhoun was uh, very minimal. It's it's uh, basically a, a gate that opens, lets water in from the Missouri River. It's just a rod that got bent. It'll be fixed directly, and, and uh, it's not any big nuclear project, so to speak. That, you know, because I agree, anytime you talk nuclear repairs, you, you cringe, but this is just a mechanical thing. Uh, anything else you want to add? Uh, it was... Uh the other maintenance was uh, stuff we always keep that if we do have a unit shut down, we go ahead and do that maintenance. Not required online, but we do it if we have the opportunity, uh, which we did on some of those items, and they were all fairly straightforward, normal maintenance, but not large cost items, and definitely won't affect the rates. And uh, same with North Omaha, or Nebraska City, any stations we have down right now. Okay, thank you. You bet. Howdy. Matt Cronin, 4515 Charles Street. I'm glad to hear the plants are going to make it. I'm, uh, I'm a little concerned of the public power system, and I really, my family, never grew up with a lot of money. We used to have an old jalopy, an old beater car, and uh, you put more and more money into it, and it got you where you needed to be, but at what cost, right? We kept putting more and more money into it, and you... We don't see an increase in efficiency. It was made for a time when my father was a young man. He probably had it since that age. And it has fundamental limits to what it can do and with where we want to go. And so once my family realized after a certain amount of time that this is not the means that we should be moving, that this is actually getting us, putting us back when we thought that this, you know, holding on to this, this piece of infrastructure that we had that this was the right thing to do. And it makes sense at the time, right? Short-term payments, you can mediate the strain or help, you know, not make that big purchase like it would otherwise seem, you know, un unaccessible, you know, especially for if you don't have that disposable income. You know, we have, we have the public power system. This is very, very special. And the whole MUD, you know, trying to sell our privatized municipal services um, I feel if we continue on this route, if we continue doing these short-term investments in these systems that aren't investing in the resilience of this state, that don't empower the people to really care where their power comes from, you know, that doesn't, when we continue to disconnect where we, we get our energy, you know, yes, any kids, I teach a lot of kids and they all, you know, ask them where their power comes, they say the light switch, you know, what if you could just say, yeah, that power came from the sun, you know. The fossil fuels, they, they also come from the sun, just a much more expensive process of the long term. So what I want to leave with is, if we can really start to add up these costs, add up all these, these continual investments and, you know, these transitions to new power plants or new updated facilities, what does it look like when we really add into the cost of distribution? You know, we, you, you all are all, obliged to pursue the most cost-effective means of producing power. But what about distribution? You talk about the loads that we've been having during these cold snaps. 
Well, if we had other ways to mediate that strain on the grid, well, if we had investments that actually valued the citizens' health and valued our, my future, the future of my kids when I have them. So I just want to leave you with that. Please consider something else because the way things are going, we're, we're driving this old jalopy into the ground and by the time it breaks down officially, we're going to have to sell it off and then, like you said, we're going to be left with a bigger cost in the end. So, thank you. Good morning. John Atkins of Nebraska Wildlife Federation representing our members uh, in OPB territory and the rest of the state. Um, everybody's entitled to their own opinion, but I don't think everybody's entitled to their own set of facts. And one of the difficulties and issues that are made controversial is where do you go for your facts and who do you believe? In general, I think it's a, a pretty good idea to go to the people who are experts, who do the work all day, every day, who are, rep who are recognized in their field uh, for doing excellent work. Um, if I want to know how to run a coal plant, I know there's people here uh, who are the experts and who know what they're doing on running a coal-fired power plant. No question about that. In matters of climate and the effects of CO2, I think the same principle applies. You can either make your life's work, as they do in large part, um, reading the scientific papers about the understanding of climate and its components and their pretty complex interactions, or you can go to the experts, the climate scientists, in ways that they make it more understandable for us. Websites like uh, blogs, like realclimate.org and skepticalscience.com, uh, run by climate scientists to, to get actual information and, and science-based facts out. Since there's been some assertions made, I just, I'll just pick on a couple of them. Uh, the, from information that I get from reading the papers and from, from going to the more popularly written sites. Uh, sure, there's been other times when CO2 has been at a different concentration that has a particular cause and a particular effect. And of course, the cause for the increased carbon dioxide in the atmosphere now is human activity of various kinds and the negative sense deforestation in the positive sense uh, primarily industrial activity, including, and of course in the United States, the most important single factor, the burning of coal. You can see in some of the uh, studies of the effects of increased CO2 in plants that there is some boost in apparent immediate productivity. But for instance, in a crop that's of some interest to us, uh, soybeans, Everything looks good until you realize that their immune system seems to be compromised <clears throat> by this, the CO2. So superficially it all looks pretty good, but you start really beating on the problem and, and examining it closely and it's really not that simple. A paper that, uh, and a, a thread of research that has recently gotten my attention came out of the University of Hawaii where they define climate departure, that is, when are we really different? We talk about climate change and going to new climates and what the heck does that mean? They define it as when the uh, climate parameters like temperature get beyond the bounds of experience for the past um, 140 or so years. When you look at it at, in that way, it appears that a little detail has been overlooked that entering a new climate regime is happening much more quickly when defined that way. In the tropics, it will happen at the end of this decade, and we will get there, here, by mid-century. And all you farmers on the, on the board know that you don't have to have real high temperatures all the time to have an effect on agriculture. You have that, that change at just the wrong time, and it, it messes up the whole season. So. I just wanted to, to bring those things uh, to your attention, and we'll be following up with you on it. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Director Gay, you said you wanted to make a comment? Yeah. Uh, I was just a little slow in the switch when we were doing the presentation.